All right, Steve, uh, you can start right now uh, if you want. Okay, thank you. First, I'd like to thank Juan and Michael for organizing the conference for in, and for inviting me. I'm very grateful and I'm really, I really regret that I can't be there. It would have been a pleasure to actually interact with people uh, non-virtually. Um, okay, the point of this paper is to show that cult in the desert evolves and it, it has to be commensurate with the actual societies of the desert. We tend to flatten pastoral nomads. We tend to see the transition from hunting gathering to pastoral nomadism in the desert as a one-step process. We hit pastoral nomadism and everything is flat. So this paper will first describe the major changes that occur over the course of millennia in the societies, in the mobile pastoral societies of the desert. And then I will try to show how the cult systems evolve as well. Okay, and now I have to move my cursor so that we can actually see. There we go. Okay, so the first thing I wanna note along these lines is that there's, the desert systems operate independently and autonomously from the sedentary systems. We have major differences in everything. And on the, in the red, you see the sequence uh, in the settled zone. And on the left, you see the uh, sequence in the desert. You also see the changing forms of, eco of economy and the changing forms of, or the changing animals in the desert. There's nothing static about desert societies. We tend to flatten them. We tend to see them as Bedouin. They're not Bedouin. Bedouin are a modern adaptation. This is just a quick review of the changes in animal exploitation. We have a sequence of animals that are adopted into the desert. Not only are they cumulative, but the way they're exploited changes. We have technological changes. I recognize now um, that uh, the uh, North Arabian saddle is not perhaps the revolution that people once claimed, but there's a North Arabian saddle. This is probably a Nabataean painted cave. It still was an innovation. And of course, desert kites were an innovation with all sorts of implications in terms of community organization. Um, we also see arrowhead sequences that change significantly. The technologies change and they probably reflect both changes in the animals themselves, the animals hunted, changes in the technologies and changes in the forms of production, the organization of production. So again, over the course of the thousands of years of pastoral nomadism in the desert, mobile pastoralism in the desert, we have constant evolving technologies, constant evolving um, uh, cultures. We also have demographic changes and territorial changes. Here you see, this is, this is taken from the Negev Emergency Survey. We have um, fluctuating numbers of sites, which undoubtedly represent changes in demographic patterns. In the, these are all from the central Negev and from the northern Negev. And on the bottom right, you see general population increase in the early Bronze Age uh, in the late Timnian culture, probably the result of connections with the North as a result of urbanism. But the real point again is that we have a very, very dynamic system. That dynamic system can also be translated to changing territoriality, to shifting edges of pastoral zones, buffer zones, and uh, agricultural zones. We can actually translate this to maps. On the left, you see a early, an early Bronze Age, late Timnian map of settlement systems where the edge of pastoral systems gets to. And you can see that on the right during the Byzantine period, agriculture extends very deep into the desert. 
Again, the whole idea is that we have a very, very dynamic system. There's nothing flat. There are constant changes. We also have very significant changes in seasonality patterns amongst the pastoralists in the desert. We tend, when we look at these, we tend to adopt rather simple systems based on ethnography and on ecology. That's actually inappropriate. From period to period, we have significant changes in patterns of seasonality, which are dictated by economics, by changing requirements of the animals, by changing territorialities of the people, and also, I think, by changing cult systems. So from period to period, we also have major changes in seasonality. This all goes basically to say that pastoral systems in the desert are dynamic. They evolve. I think that in general, they evolve to greater complexity, although, that's, although that is not linear. And as a corollary, the cult systems in the desert have to match the actual cultural systems. We tend to look at cult systems independently of the rest of the culture. We tend to look at them independently of demography and independently of economics, et cetera. We need to integrate. Let me just um, catch up with where we... Uh... Okay, this is just a slide of some of the different kinds of cult manifestations. And I'm focusing on the negative. OK, um, and what you see are standing stones of different kinds. You see a, you see mosques, you see desert lines, shrines, you see um, tumuli, tumulus systems, you see rock art, you see geoglyphs. We have a large range of different kinds of cult manifestations. The archaeology of cult in the desert is complex. I want to um, here make one thing very clear. All cult is complex. All cultures have complex cosmologies. All we need to do to understand this is to look at the Australian Aborigine dream time systems to understand the symbolic complexity of all cult. But that doesn't mean that all cult is the same. We see manifestations of things like centralization, political hierarchy, demography, uh, ter and territoriality, and the need to demonstrate or claim territories. These things change with the structures of society. So when I talk about complexity, I'm not talking about complexity of beliefs. I'm talking about the manifestations of cult in the desert and how they reflect changes in these societies. Uzi Avner has suggested that there is a, a culture called the Rodedian, a PPNB culture, especially characterized by the presence of standing stone systems, orthostats, various kinds of orthostats. Uh, without going into a critique here and accepting at face value that um, there are orthostats associated with the PPNB. And again, we're talking about, we're not talking about Bill's PPNB here. We're talking about the PPNB of hunter gatherers in the deeper desert. We need to understand that it takes a couple of hours to build one of these things. And in the sites that you will see, we're talking about tens of days of labor, 60 days of labor. Um, these are fundamentally domestic cult sites. Okay, there's a fundamental difference between what's happening in the PPNB and even in the PPNC and what happens later. Sometime in the mid sixth millennium BC, we begin to get 
centralized cult systems. The earliest one, it's not, it's not the only one in the state, but the most impressive is the one at the Uv, at Uvda Valley 6. You see pictures on the upper right and lower right, uh, actually all around, except for the one in the middle from Enyarka, uh, relate to that Uvda Valley 6. Um, it reflects some kind of centralized cult. It reflects symbolism. It reflects some kind of orientation, cosmological orientation. Um, we also have geoglyphs. The geoglyphs are difficult to date. We have them in sites which seem to date to different periods, but we'll leave that aside for the time being. Uh, the Ain Yarka site, which Rottenberg did not publish properly, was not PPNB and also seems to relate to the same, uh, same phenomena. Note that both at Ain Yarka and at Uvda 6, we have standing stones uh, in the middle of some kind of installation in these features. This may reflect some kind of continuity, some kind of symbolic continuity with the preceding period. We also have similar, we have things going on in Jordan as well. Fuji has documented a series of uh, really interesting, undoubtedly cold sites in uh, southern Jordan. He suggested in the rectangular aspects that we're talking about connections to the PPNB proper in the settled zone. I can't comment on that. These are fundamentally different sites than what we see in the Negev. Uh, they're roughly dated the same time. They may even be a little bit earlier. By the late sixth millennium, we begin to get massive centralized sites in the Negev and in Sinai. This is the one I excavated at Ramat Saharonim. Uh, you see complex solstice orientations, massive stones. Uh, the lower left is an unexcavated shrine and the lower right is a different shrine from the same site excavated where we can estimate the mass of the shrine at over 30 tons. That translates to about uh, 60 days of work in terms of construction, very roughly. Hold on. So these massive shrines, let me just see what's coming up. Okay, so here's a, here's a reconstruction. Also gives you an idea of scale. They stood to about a meter high, and that long wall is 22 meters long. It's aligned with the setting sun of the summer solstice. I've suggested elsewhere that these sites reflect the fundamental changes associated with the adoption of herd animals into the desert. They reflect territoriality, the rise of greater territoriality, the need to establish, to legitimize changing hierarchies. And they certainly reflect a major change in um, the organization of labor. Previous societies, earlier societies, as we saw, the orthostats require a few hours of work. One of these shrines might require 60, uh, 60 days of labor. That might be 10 people working for six days or six people working for 10 days, but it's certainly a very different order. It's an order of magnitude different than previous times. We see a very similar thing happening in, um, in the rise of cairn fields, massive burial, massive mortuary structures, which also anywhere between 20 and 60 days of labor to build these things with multiple burials, often multiple burials, burials with complex ritual associated with them. So sometimes with um, uh, sometimes with primary burials, secondary burials, and bone reorganization. These also undoubtedly reflect some kind of territorial aspect. 
you can see that you they're visible from a great distance. Okay, so again, complex behaviors rising circa 5,000 plus or minus 5,000 BCE. And I, I think it must be connected with the rise of tribal societies based upon herding of sheep and goat. One of the things that we can see here, especially on the right, you see this is a site called uh, Ramatamar 1. And on the right, you see the stratigraphy of these, um, uh, of these cairns. And what we can see is bones are buried in the central interment cyst at different levels. Um, I think we all are aware that we're not really talking about burial, burials, we're talking about interments. They're a form of exposure, um, but uh, they take place over the course of several millennia. These things are used and reused. Obviously there are changes in the type of use, but there is a, a sanctity of place that is well evident here. Tabular scrapers, I just want to touch on material culture. Tabular scrapers are a cult item. We know that they were used as knives. We know that they were deliberately broken. We know that they're placed in tumuli as offerings or some such. And we know that they have, many of them carry incisions, symbolic incisions. These things end circa 22, 2300 BCE. They coincide with all of these other features with what I have dubbed the Timnian culture, the Timnian culture complex. Rock art in the Negev is a little bit different. Um, it does not seem to be attached to cult. It seems to be attached to tribal identity and personal identity. We have, a, we have a sequence. It is interesting even here, though, that with the rise of Islam, much of the iconography of, of rock art disappears, and we have a major shift towards abstract rock art. The second millennium BCE constitutes a serious problem for us. There are no occupation sites in the central Negev. So claims for indigenous societies, invisible nomads, hyper nomads in the Negev in this period are untenable. The sites that we're looking at here, which are Timna and Kuntilat Ajrud and Khorvat Kitmit, these are sites which are the result of external influences, trade routes, pilgrimage routes. They don't seem to have anything to do with um, local indigenous pastoralists. So we can't actually reconstruct a local indigenous religion or belief system in these periods. We don't have it, we can't associate. Uh, we don't have the sites. Now I wanna very briefly go over what happens in the very later periods. We don't have any sites associated and we have lots of Nabataean campsites. And aside from Uzi's work, showing the existence of orthostats along trade routes, probably attached to Nabataeans. We don't have any Nabataean shrines, which we can attach to Nabataean pastoral systems, even though we have lots of Nabataean campsites. We do have the rise of Christianity in the rock art, but it's only found along pilgrimage routes. And of course, in the major settled systems. We have the rise of Islam, and Gidon Avni has noted that uh, we can trace in these open air mosques, which we find in direct association with campsites, with the entire system of campsites in the desert, we can trace the adoption of Islam and its adaptation to pastoral systems in the desert. And Gidon, and I think rightly, has suggested that in these architectures, we can see continuities 
with earlier, uh, uh, earlier cult systems. In the, one, in the upper right, uh, upper left, we can see um, a standing stone in place of a mihrab, for example. It's always good to end with Shelley. I want to reiterate something again. We need to integrate our studies of cult with the general history of pastoral systems of mobile peoples in the desert. We cannot make assumptions, for example, about monotheism arising in the desert amongst people who were heterarchical and not hierarchical. We need to, we need to match our religious reconstructions, our cult reconstructions, to the basic socio sociology of desert peoples. I thank you kindly. Thank you very much, Steve, for your for your presentation. I think that we have a 